one of the great joys of visiting English churches, and a great cultural treasure they house, is an array of funerary monuments and tombs. These monuments are often the finest examples of the sculptor's art we have from the past eight centuries, and they often reveal just a little glimpse of the very complex family relationships of the people they commemorate. I am at Theddlethorpe All Saints in a very remote part of Lincolnshire, where the monuments in the church's chancel here provide touching evidence of great loss and tragedy, and also a very unusual relationship that saw a woman recover from that loss and afford a much younger man the opportunity to have an affluent future. One of the monuments in the chancel here is a very fine example of early 18th century classical sculpture. It is the work of a London sculptor called Andrew Carpenter. Well, he was really called André Carpentier. He was from a family of Flemish or perhaps French immigrants. From 1714, Andrew Carpenter had a workshop on Piccadilly in the heart of the fashionable St James's district of London, where he was producing monuments for the aristocracy like this one and casting classical style lead ornaments for the pleasure grounds of English country houses. This monument at Theddlethorpe, which is a cool and restrained classical piece in marble, has two busts on it that represent the Honourable Charles Barty, who was an aristocrat and the youngest son of the third Earl of Lindsay, and his wife, a widow called Mary Newcomen. Mary died in 1725 and Charles in 1727, and the monument for which the contract survives cost the grand total of £150. It was commissioned in August of 1730 by Charles Barty's executors, with a very tight completion date for Carpenter. It was to be completed by Christmas of 1730 and erected here in Theddlethorpe. What is not immediately apparent when you look at the representations of this couple is the rather unusual relationship between Mr Barty and his wife. Barty was Mary's second husband and they had a considerable age gap between them. He was 31 and she was 53 when they were married in 1714. Now Charles Barty, as the youngest son of an earl, was a spare rather than an heir and had no property of his own or any chance of inheriting any from his family, though he was probably kept supplied with money by his mother, the Dowager Countess of Lindsay, and by his elder brother, the first Duke of Ancaster. As a young man, he seems to have had little purpose or direction, which is perhaps no real surprise. I suspect he may have been a bit of a spoiled mummy's boy. There's no record of him attending either Oxford or Cambridge universities, which the aristocracy were patronising in this period. In 1705, when he is 22, he manages to gain a seat in Parliament. He sat as one of two members of Parliament for the tiny borough of New Woodstock in Oxfordshire. He was elected, in theory, rather than in practice, as his seat was what was termed a pocket borough. In other words, it was controlled by a landowner, and the landowner, who was his patron, was his first cousin, the second Earl of Abingdon. As an MP, he seems to have set himself up in a house in Chelsea, no doubt enjoying being a man about town. He doesn't, for whatever reason, stand again in the 1708 election. But instead, aged 25, he suddenly expresses an interest in joining the army and taking a commission as a captain in the foot guards. And it is his mother, the Dowager Countess of Lindsay, who tries to make the appropriate arrangements. But it comes to nothing. We have no idea what Charles did with himself between 1708 and 1714 when he marries Mary Newcomen. The marriage was certainly a very good prospect for Charles Barty, for Mary Newcomen of Theddlethorpe was a widow with no living children. As well as inheriting her deceased husband's estates, Mary was also her father's heiress, and she was very rich indeed. So Charles's marriage to Mary gave him an estate, it gave him wealth, it gave him position, and it gave him purpose. In 1714, when Mary uh, married Charles, she'd been widowed for two years. Her late husband, Nicholas Newcomen, whom she'd been married to for 33 years, 
had died in August of 1712. When he died, Mary laid Nicholas to rest under a black marble slab beside the communion table in the chancel. In fact, the slab records that the marble altar, a very unusual thing in an Anglican parish church, was his memorial too. His monument demonstrates Mary's great love for Nicholas, a man she records as having an innate integrity and purity of character. When Mary dies herself in 1725, she is not buried beside her first husband, but she's buried further down in the centre of the chancel. And it is here on the floor around her grave slab that the tragedy of Mary and Nicholas's marriage is revealed. On either side of her are the grave slabs of her two children, a son and a daughter. On the right of her is the grave of her only daughter Mary, who died in 1694, when she was ten. Her only son Nicholas is on the left. He died in 1705, when he was 23. By the time of his death, there would have been little prospect of Nicholas and Mary Newcomen having any further children, and their final years together must have felt terribly bleak. On the wall of the chancel, Mary and Nicholas erected two beautiful memorial tablets to commemorate their lost children. The one of little Mary is in the Baroque manner, as you'd expect from the late 17th century, a cartouche topped with an urn and with an inscription engraved on in English upon a swag, relating that she was the only daughter of an only daughter. Young Nicholas Newcomen was an aspiring lawyer when he died in 1704, he had studied at Lincoln College, Oxford, where he matriculated in 1698 at the age of 17, and he was a student at the Inner Temple in London from 1699. Sadly, his monument has been damaged. It fell off the wall when the church decayed in the last century. Bits of it have been returned to the wall. As you might expect of a monument to a young man of intellect, the inscription is in Latin. Death and decay destroys great promise in every age. So what do we make of the relationship between Charles Barty and the grieving widow Mary Newcomen? Was all the advantage on his side? Well we'll never know and to draw too firm a conclusion is to go beyond the evidence into the realm of idle speculation. One thing to note is that Charles Barty was only a year younger than Mary's son, Nicholas Newcomen. Mary was, of course, beyond bearing children when she married Charles in 1714, and he cannot have had any prospect of an heir from her. Perhaps Mary saw in Charles more of a son than a husband, someone who would be a good pair of hands to inherit her lost son's inheritance. One thing that suggests that the marriage may well have been one of convenience is that Charles Barty marries again very quickly after Mary's death. Mary died on the 4th of November 1725 and Charles married his second wife, another Mary, Mary Marshall, the daughter of a local parson, on the 13th of February 1726. When Charles Barty dies in August of 1727, aged only 42, he was buried in the chancel at Thettlethorpe under another black stone on the opposite side from the altar to Mary's first husband and surrounded by his wife's family. This is why I find churches so very fascinating. There's always something within them that gives you an insight into the lives people have lived in the past. It was just as complicated to be alive in the 17th and 18th century as it is in the 21st. Thanks very much for watching.